Hello everyone, today we talk about the Dauphiné policy during the 13th century. Just a couple of weeks ago I made a video about the Dauphiné in general and uh, the second one is a testament to the total randomness and unpredictability of my content choice uh, outside from, from the cycles that of course of, of content that I um, periodically in fact uh, discuss that can make us understand better some political territorial dynamics of the Dauphiné in its peak moment, right? Um, as we have seen in the historical region series, essentially European polities have a pretty common development uh, during the high Middle Ages with a process essentially of statal compaction of some sort, then the 14th triggers some uh, general shrinking crisis due to the contraction of the world intercontinental system uh, as you know and that is curiously reflected by dynastic crisis that has nothing say more incidentally biological than in the previous centuries for the Dauphiné we will see it better today but we already discussed it in the previous video um, there were a couple of dynasties that succeeded each other uh, during the period, but between the 13th and 14th century, what we witness is essentially a, a political territorial compaction, not just from within the systems, but also from the outer ones. Um, in this case, we will mostly uh, talk about France, as you understand, even though, say, uh, the, the Dauphiné was uh, Burgundy and even not part properly of the Kingdom of France, as uh, as part actually of, of the Holy Roman Empire, bringing a principality of the same. But we will see how during um, the latter period, that today in the 14th century we don't see with the uh, proper absorption of the uh, of the Dauphiné within the, the French orbit, the bigger powers managed to knock out the others according to a process that today we do not have the time to, to di digress on, but it is hotly debated just yesterday it was pointing that out in a conference right because right, people say well you know in the mid 14th century it was just a demographic crisis yes but what was this caused by and you know yes the plague but sometimes we see this phenomenon way before the plague and yes there were other illnesses and whatever but still is there a more systemic explanation of the wall uh, and in my opinion most of the answer is political right not just there is obviously the taking over of the um, weaker polities um, but these uh, are not kind of obliterated in the sense that people are just passively obeying uh, they decide in, in a completely uh, universal guise according to the political juridical practice of this time of accepting somebody else's rule either because the local government has become de facto capable of protecting the system and or because of course resisting would entail further war disruption whatever and or because there is also a broader need you know in a cultural sense to to accept kind of being part of a broader more functional system this doesn't happen everywhere there are many frontier areas where you see that politics manage to maintain their own autonomy even increasing one in, in fact talking about the Dauphiné and as we will see also about the neighboring Savoy that we still haven't discussed if not in that video about the Valdensians in the war between Louis XIV and Victor Amadeus of, of Savoy uh, has a very gradual constant kind of methodic <laughs> um, growth, right? This is the same time, I don't know, the, the birth of the Swiss Confederacy and uh, uh, other polities that, especially in these big frontier areas of Europe, such as, in fact, uh, the Kingdom of Burgundy was and others, um, would flourish eventually f uh, to a, towards a, a brighter future, we can say. In the case of Savoy, it's because they managed to consolidate Piedmont, which was another story. The Dauphiné, instead, wouldn't make it because it, it remains an heraldic force mostly um, in a privatized sense. We will see there is an important difference between the um, institutional administrative development of Savoy and the one of the Dauphiné. The, lat uh, the, the former was uh, ahead like in a century even in, 
But there is an important accomplishment of the Dauphiné during the 13th century. Um, due to all the, the factors we will see now that are get down obviously to, a, to shrewd successful policies uh, and that has much to do with the ongoing struggle not much between France and the Holy Roman Empire per se right because Germany during the 13th century dramatically fragments and of course France does take advantage of it but it also has kind of problems uh, on its own and doesn't interfere literally with everything but rather the, the clash between the papacy and the Holy Roman Empire and the possibility of France of playing on this um, in a moment of also very fast as you know political territorial recompaction of the Capetian kingdom uh, we will, these are the same years of the Albigensian crusade and as we will see the Dauphiné was involved in and uh, also as the, the, probably the, the entire sum of uh, dynastic possessions that uh, the the fun had been acquiring at this point um, in um, in this of course gradual affirmation of, of the French monarchy the the influences of some more updated administrative systems and it, it's a highly successful considering uh, the wall in spite of the problems also in fact of territorial recompaction with some wedges within uh, the Saint Dauphiné territory, the the leverage made by Savoy on internal conflict, that in the, in the sense transforms the local conflictuality in a proxy war between France and the Holy Roman Empire. Um, so, as we were saying, the Dauphiné was properly a principality of, of the latter, right? And it had matured. Uh, it's, and, and there was always this enormous ambiguity regarding the Kingdom of Burgundy that, again, yes, was formally part, just like at this point, Germany, Italy, Bohemia, of the Holy Roman Empire as such. Um, but that the the emperors had fundamentally never quite visited, right? The, the, the only emperor that had a pretty direct involvement went in uh, in Ireland, Vienna, etc., was Frederick Barbarossa. I don't even think when he, whether he went to Ireland specifically. But let's say reaffirming the direct control was not as important in in um, in Burgundy as to uh, as opposed to Italy or the same Germany. So um, this area remained a bit on its own, and the local dynasts exploited this to kind of create a polity on their own. But with all the difficulties deriving from a lack of a central authority, right? That would, in fact, make especially the Dauphiné much more uh, privatized and somehow also backwards compared to to other neighboring polities, as we've seen. Um, the Dauphiné at this point, spoiler for those who haven't heard, um, uh, say, the thing and haven't listened to the, the previous video, but I think it's pretty well known that at this point, it has nothing to do with France, nor with the title of the fun, the dolphin, and uh, that um, uh, was um, would be adopted, as you know, in the French monarchy as the official feudal title of the heir to the French crown, but that effectively was covered in, in, in a form of local ruler in the Dauphiné, just by Louis XI, about whom I also made a video last autumn, explaining from his side of the story, but what was the deal there, but we're talking, as you know, about the second half of the 15th century in, in a moment in which the Dauphiné had already been incorporated de facto within within France. The Dauphin stems from an obscure heraldic origin, some say it has to do with a uh, Hellenic Roman legion of broader Indo-European background, the idea of some sort of um, uh, monster, right, of Ketonic maritime a creature that the local hero slains, and from from the uh, teeth of which, a bit like this in the slaying of the dragon, lots of different uh, warriors, knights uh, emerge and begin to 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 follow the ruler. This kind of um, broader legions, like lost in the in the mist of uh, the ancient and kind of early medieval history, that they probably knew in meaning that, but we 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 unfortunately ha lost in, in this case. Um, and of course, 
heraldic is very variegated, so even saying, yes, that this is a pretty watery area with the Rhone, its affluence and so on, it has relatively to do with the um, with the water mammal per se, and it's just a symbol. But not, don't underestimate even the the meaning behind such thing. Think about the Tarasque, uh, in Tarascon, in fact, and other similar um, dragon-like kind of reptile figures in the broader symbolism of, of the evil, the tectonic element crushed by the Uranian era and so on. Uh, and the, the term Dauphiné um, is also an approximation for, in fact, this broader seigneury that was formed over different dynastic possessions. And as a term is used only for the first time in 1293, so relatively late, to designate specifically the territories ruled by the counts of Viennois and of Albon, that were the ancestral core lands of the seigneury, which had originated in the early 11th century, when the Count Archbishop of Vienne, most important um, center after Arles in the Kingdom of Burgundy, ceded the southern half of the Viennois itself, except for the very city of Vienne, to the Lord of Vion, who was also Count of Albon. While the northern half of the, of, um, of the Viennois was ceded to the Count of Maurienne, that would have been no one else but the founder of the House of Savoy herself. Um, so these two dynasties, the Counts of Albon and the ones of Savoy, were a bit the moral heirs of the uh, essentially upper Burgundy, right? It was essentially the continental part of Bung Burgundy emerged from the Romano-Germanic kingdom territorial, this area of Sepaudi, and with this important, in fact, in the Rhone Valley, Roman centers. Vienne, especially, and Ar, too, that instead was uh, at the um, at the head of the of the Mediterranean uh, province in in the in the south, right, and having kind of a more Roman profile, you know, having less um, uh, privatization, more kind of centralized administrative structures. Where, whereas this north of the Dauphin and of the Counts of Savoy were was a bit more feudal uh, in nature. Uh, as you understand, there was also a fierce competition between the two houses. The original ruling family of the Dauphiné, or what we call, in fact, later as such, came to an end in the male line in 1162, when the Dauphin, Gig V, died. Gig V's father, Gig uh, IV, was the first Dauphin, right? The first ruler who acquired... Uh, in the in the coat of arms, the, the symbol of the dolphin, and making it the one of the ruling house. Gig the fifth's daughter Beatrice, after the death of her first husband, married the Duke Hugh the Third of Burgundy, also in his second um, marriage in 1184, and their offspring known as, in fact, the uh, Burgundian dynasty of the Dauphiné, ruled uh, the land for most of the 13th century. So, at the beginning of uh, the century, the Dauphin holdings include the Grésivaudan, that is essentially the valley of the Isère River from uh, the frontier with Savoy to the Valentinois, also the Romanche River Valley, then the Briançonnet, which borders the southeast of the Cosivadon and centers fundamentally uh, upon the upper valley of the Dorance River with the uh, Mont Genevre Pass opening into Piedmont in the east. Plus, there were the lands of the southern Viennois. And these possessions were already consistent, as you understand, being also very strategic um, in nature, uh, as you can even see, the not particularly advanced areas, also pretty mountainous ones. But exactly for this reason, having an important control on the various routes uh, with 
uh, towards Italy, Central Europe, the Mediterranean, France uh, proper in the north. So um, quite meaningful and gravitating also around this broader center of Vienne, uh, the Count Archbishop of which detained uh, an enormous prestige in the area, right? And could, and to which technically, again, the Dauphin, um, at least for, for the territories that pertained to the, to the County of Vienne, were vassals. Mm -hmm. This is true also for, for Savoy. Um, so there was the the ghost still of, of the Kingdom of Burgundy per se as a as a unitary policy and institution that could provide with further prestige. Um, these um, these uh, these dynasties were quite clever in exploiting what, what was left of that telling the truth because mostly again the the kingdom existed formally um, on paper, yes, uh, paper, which was being introduced uh, exactly at this time. And um, that, um, however, in fact, had gone depleted, right? It was not really a king, or at least the Holy Roman Emperor was, but as we've seen, his presence wasn't enormously to be felt. If anything, he would back, as we'll see now, some uh, proxies to to extend its control uh, on, on the area. Um, so a major leap forward in this territorial dominion occurred in 1202, when Gig VI, ruling between 1192 and 1236, married Beatrice de Clostral, that was the granddaughter of the Count of Fort Calcieux. Um, whose dowry consisted of the counties of Gap and Embrun, um, mountainous areas fundamentally that bordered the um, the southern frontier, the Grésivaudan and the Bransonnet, up to the Durance River, which constituted also the border with Provence. Mm -hmm. This was a major mm, push towards the south can't say. Uh, and you understand the importance of marriages here and the necessity for these houses to essentially marry into each other so that according to the feudal right of the time, at least if, if one branch when extinguished, was the possibility of simply preserving the whole thing through the compaction of the territories under a greater, uh, a greater house at that point. This is often overlooked, like you may wonder why certain um, medieval polities preferred foreign rule at the extension of a local dynasty, even assuming that this was technically one. And the reason was, of course, that such um, dynasties of fort was to maintain their patrimonies intact, whereas all the various vassals wanted just to fragment what had been accomplished, because their goal was exactly the same, but in, in the absence of a dynastic uh, right of succession, they would rather use other means that was also uh, conquest or, or other more um, other systems that were, however, somehow more detrimental, at least to, to the unity of, of the previous world. So it was kind of better to kind of welcome some other great name, right, of the surrounding uh, nobility, then given into to these uh, kind of lesser uh, rulers. Naturally, everything was very balanced. Like you can't say who's uh, just a minor ruler and a bigger one sometimes, right? But generally speaking, by the 13th century, we are seeing really such important feudal states emerging, and uh, these were very worth preserving. Um, when the first member of the La Tour du Pain, Humbert, became Dauphin in 1282, as we will see essentially after the death of John I of, Burg uh, of the Bur Burgundian dynasty, at least of the Dauphiné without hair, etc., and there would be a succession, uh, succession crisis at that point, but we will see it in the end. Um, his ancestral barony, the one of the Tour du Pain, uh, in the northeastern Viennois, became part of the 
Dauphiné, the man too. Mm -hmm. um, and at the beginning of the following century, the baronies of Montauban in 1300 and the one of Mauvillon in 1317 in the south extended the uh, Dauphiné even up to the borders of the Comtat Venaison that as you will see is essentially what would remain a, a papal enclave uh, up to the French Revolution after this era would eventually pass in fact to the um, to the pontiffs. Uh, there was thus in such political territorial recompaction from a geographical point of view only the county of Valentinois du preventing the Dauphiné from suzerainty over the entire region uh, between Savoy and Provence. Mm -hmm. This was a particularly important recompaction because again in, in the Burgundian kingdom the bishops had had generally speaking an, an important power, the city per se as, as a consequence as the center of comital power and uh, in a sense it was less of a feudal land than, than the north of France proper but um, it it had I exactly because of this of a strong feudal monarchy uh, the country had lacked such um, uh, territorial cohesion and it was a big deal even just between Savoy and Provence having an entire polity right territorial on, on its own right and these were fairly rich areas that were expanding further with the Rhone Valley and so on the, the Council of Valentinois du uh, the duals from the uh, were a very serious obstacle to the political and territorial cohesion of the Dauphiné proper. Mm -hmm. However, the area was not just it, right? There were many other surrounding powers that exercised uh, some various degree of influence. The most important one in Occitania, in today's southern France, were the Counts of Toulouse. I, I made a video about. Uh, such policy that is after Aquitaine the most important as you know um, in, in Occitania and that um, was not much of a feudal power it was essentially a mix between a quasi city state centered in Toulouse and still however a comital presence the one of Toulouse which basically the two powers counterbalance each other and even though they had a uh, great prestige um, they wouldn't uh, have such a direct control on this pretty extended surrounding area that they tried to extend this, their power essentially towards the northeast, the east, so exactly towards the area of the uh, Dauphiné. The Counts of Toulouse held the so-called Marquisate of Provence that wasn't in the sense quite um, like a, an international feudal official form of rec recognition, right? But Toulouse was pretty involved with um, Catalonian policy. Um, they had an important thus influence also on the Mediterra Mediterranean coast. So the aim of hegemonizing Arles and Provence, and thus the Rhone mouth, was always um, an actually since ancient times. Uh, a major a major goal right and this did affect as you understand the own affairs of the um, of the Dauphiné because um, the, the, the so-called Marquisate of Provence in theory bounded was bounded by the Isère the, the Rhone the Durant so and the mountains on these so exactly the borders of, of the Dauphiné uh, and this was just in terms of territorial claims we're not talking about political uh, influence. The Counts of Valentinois du were essentially vassals of Toulouse uh, in virtue of these, um, these claims and of course still of the Holy Roman Empire at the same time. Right? So you know that all territories east of the Rhone River, right? so on the left of the Rhone, uh, were Holy Roman Empire except for Lyon that even if it, it, it's on the right bank of the river it was always considered part of the Holy Roman Empire and then so everything west instead is Western Frankish Kingdom including the county of Toulouse 
right? And including even what was the ancient Spanish mark, right? And that, that's why the French at some point would enter so uh, with Philip III. But already this time, as we will see with the Albigensian Crusade, towards the southwest that interested them more than even the southeast, so where the Dauphiné uh, lay. Um, and, and of course, the, the superimposition of a Western Frankish policy in the and uh, Holy, at this point, properly French one, because we're talking about the time of Philip II that introduced properly the, the idea of the Royaume de France uh, in vernacular. And of the Holy Roman Emperor were thus um, uh, the King of Burgundy um, by name, were already evident at this point. And uh, the Dauphins were thus, even though threatened by some French subjugation, as we will see now, however, closer paradoxically to the to the northeastern dimension, both in fact the northern French one and the especially the Holy Roman Imperial one, then to the Count of Toulouse, arguably, and her ambitions. So much so that we will see now what happens during the Albigensian Crusade. There was much in common as well deep interest with the Count of, of Toulouse, because still, in an Occitanian perspective, it was important to preserve this kind of sort of decentralized status where the Capetian um, uh, situation where the Capetians had not stepped in yet. Um, but there were internal struggles uh, and competition between each other as well. Um, the, uh, the the Counts of Valentuna Dua thus also had nothing to do with the Dauphiné per se, right? By the end of the 13th century, they acquired on, on their own um, the important barony of Saint-Vier, saint, -Vier, saint excuse me, and on, on their own in the southwest of Vinois as well. So, stepping in, right? Uh, the, the traditional area of influence of, of, this, of the Dauphiné by something that was more than just vassalatic expansion but actually sanctioned by the, the same Archbishop and Count of, of Viennois as the most important authority, in fact, in the Count. This was the kind of Western threat, the Southwestern threat. The other problem was posed by Savoy in the Northeast. Because as we've seen, the Dauphin and the Counts of Savoy had shared the Viennois by some, by some degree. Uh, the first in the south, the, the latter in, in the north. The barons of La Tour du Pont that would actually succeed, as we've seen, to the uh, Dauphiné um, mm. seigneury were also traditional enemies then the, of the Burgundian dynasty. Um, the struggle would last, in fact, until the, the dynastic um, succession in, in the 70s of the 13th century. And it's interesting how the Lo Holy Roman Emperor essentially supported from his own uh, direction the uh, La Tour du Pont. In fact, in 1245, uh, the emperor confirmed the right of Albert de la Tour du Pont to collect tolls on the transalpine route that crossed his territory. Right, and in 1257, the uh, the king of the Romans, Alphonse of Castille, named Albert seneschal of the kingdom of Arles, which was renewed by the king of the Romans, Rudolf of Habsburg, to Humbert de la Tour du Pont at Lausanne in 1275. Mm -hmm. This was essentially a way to uh, control better the area from Germany, right, or at least from a German power base, as in the case of Alphonse of Castille, that, however, ruled um, in Spain, rather, and naturally this was, as you understand, just uh, 
a favoritism on the base of say okay you can collect tolls you are the seneschal of the kingdom of Ireland that actually was a, a very important um, formal title but as we've seen um, other than that there wasn't really a, a structure could support even you know the taking over of, of the Dauphiné right uh, the important aspect of such uh, seneschalcy was putting, perhaps we're not certain about that, the barons of La Tour du Pin on a legal footing equal to the one of the Dauphin himself. Right? At least this should be measured in terms of political um, uh, allegiance. Um, it's not. It wouldn't derive from from the title per se in any case it was just a, a very big statement that the king of the romans would make in that case by saying we want essentially these guys to rule here on our behalf <laughs> and this conflict was between the, the burgundian house and one of the two of the was in fact resolved as we were saying before when uh, humbert uh, became himself Dauphin after John the first reign and uh, the La Tour du Pont beca became the Dauphiné ruling dynasty which as you understand considerably increased also with uh, the assets of the parents of the La Tour du Pont the Dauphiné assets in addition to powerful lay rivals there were many prelates that um, the Dauphins had to be wary of in their own territory. Um, the Dauphiné was uh, dotted with such ecclesiastical baronies that we can't call like this to really make you understand how um, how fragmented local power was not to make bishops just again the institutional ones of, of the end per se uh, so that was a great center but scattered a bit all over the the country a bit like in germany with this these prelates were somehow warlike but a certain degree due to the fragment the chronic fragmentation of the land uh, not even the counts of savoy had to deal with such um, ecclesiastical power in their lands such ecclesiastical lordships were the one of Vienne as we've seen but also in Braun, Grenoble, Gap, Valence and Die mm -hmm. and considered that they were as ecclesiastical mm, powers naturally overlapping also geographically with some important centers per se right uh, in some cases having literally also the lay in investiture same place as we've seen the Archbishop Counts of Vienne but others having to ex coexist with some local lay rulers at, at, at the same time that always were present right backing the, uh, the ecclesiastical authority and and, and, uh, and vice versa mm -hmm. and this could pose important problems to the Dauphiné over lordship per se. In fact, all of these ecclesiastical baronies possessed imperial charters according to them regalian rights in their dioceses. So very far from um, alienable powers in, in theory uh, as they also enjoyed for the majority the status of sovereign princes of the Holy Roman Empire as well and again remember the uh, the tradition that we have often seen especially in this kind of in countries like Italy and Burgundy to have bishops that are counts at the same time which was an imperial policy designed exactly to especially concentrate power in within the cities in this kind of uh, very urbanized southern European lands. For the county of Viennois, the Dauphin himself was a vassal of the Archbishop of Vienne. Mm -hmm. 
who traditionally held the honorary title even of Archchancellor of the Kingdom of Burgundy, just as the Archbishop of Embrun held that of Imperial Chamberlain. Thus, any move within the kingdom had to be somehow legitimized institutionally, administratively, by such prelates. However, the Dauphiné was increasing so much in concrete power that the Dauphin succeeded in forcing a peerage upon the bishops of Vienne, Embrun, Grenoble and Gap by which judicial authority was exercised jointly by Episcopal and Delphinal officials in the dioceses. Um, this procedure shows some degree of cooperation between such ecclesiastical baronies and the Dauphin, because, for example, the Counts of valentinois du were never able to achieve um, in the dioceses of uh, Vienne and the the same the same feat, right? And remember again, these were somehow kind of private powers that had formed um, within the the territories, but that hadn't traditionally covered particular institutions aside now the ones that, as we've seen, the uh, the emperors had conferred to the uh, barons of La Tour du Pont and consequently now to the the fond themselves, and that probably helped them reaching the status, right? Um, in 1276, the dioceses of Vienne and D, in order to stem the push of the Counts of Valentino, uh, Valentinois de Lois, merged uh, in order to uh, administer, govern better the resources of the, the bishop against such uh, Valentinois du expansionism and surely the Dauphin was helping the prelate uh, in the process to keep an, any other influence out and trying to create kind of a, a super state overlapping delay in the ecclesiastical dimension. The Dauphiné was subject to constant outside interference during the 13th century, as we were hinting at before. This was happening also to other surrounding territories, including the Franche Comté, that we'll have to discuss in another video, together with Savoy, etc. The most important international struggle was the one between the Empire and the Papacy, right? And uh, especially up to the, the mid of the 13th century when Frederick II died, um, such conflict provided with an enormous amount of opportunities to the uh, a bit all the magnates of the regions, telling the truth, not just the Dauphin, um, as um, the clash between the Papacy and Empire was so direct that uh, the outside lands were of course asked to, to take part but also were staying out as they were at least uh, properly of the military operations. You know, these are the years of the wars of the Second Lombard League, etc. So ferocious struggles with enor an enormous amount of resources. Burgundy was a, a bit more defiled in this in this context, and such bitter struggles actually made the same French kings had decided uh, during their bitter struggle against the the Angevin. English rivals to send lots of mm, say hot-headed barons to fight in the south of France that was uh, not just uh, a you know a hotbed of uh, heresies and kind of autonomizing policies both from the French monarchy and the papacy but also uh, the fact of um, fact an Angevin a possession, right, and thus expanding the monarchic boundaries also by trying to channel in a more unitary direction 
the most um, kind of uh, free roaming uh, knights of the kingdom and using mercenaries instead to uh, to counter the the English and uh, investing in ever more advanced administrative practice uh, and, and so on. So um, the Albigensian Crusade, I think we never discussed. First of all, in, in, in depth, we've made multiple videos about the Cathars and what they actually were. And contrarily wise to the common feeling, oh, poor Cathars were exterminated, which a terrible thing, the Crusades, whatever. Just look at what the Cathars were actually doing. And I'm not just talking from a just a political or military point of view, literally copying the entire papal system, including the Inquisition, poor cutters, um, and uh, it, except they were doing it for the wrong reason, um, but also literally having um, a radical, leftistic ideology, at least as far as the general principles of the of the heresy really were. Then for the rest, the land was firmly controlled by de facto feudal realities, but that they were winking in these kind of universal disgregating forces that um, in the 13th century were brought under instead forcefully and successfully in one of the greatest universal accomplishments in the, in the history of mankind is not just the Albigensian crusade per se, but the broader power of, you know, the Roman papacy that reaches by far the greatest peak in, in its uh, in its history exactly at this point with Innocent III, basically every Western Christian policy at this point was um, was uh, was a papal basal for not talking about the, the capture of Constantinople um, herself, even though that was more of an accident, just, of course, uh, beautifully exploited by the Roman Church, um, and also with, with an important French participation. So the Dauphiné was at the end of the day, within this, yes, these were Holy Roman Imperial lands, but were from, let's say, the Gallic watershed, so they spoke, uh, in this case, it, they were an Occitanian reality, but they were deeply involved in the uh, affairs of the Kingdom of, of France, that was literally taking off at this point, and they had to, the, to forcibly take uh, a position, right? the words, especially the, the Albigensian Crusade, that was bringing the French kings ever closer to the Dauphiné. It was a threat, but it could be also an opportunity by some degree. Aymar of Valentinois du for example, joined the Crusaders, right? As we've seen, Valentinois du were, were kind of opponents to, to the Dauphiné. But uh, his long-standing loyalty to the House of Toulouse led him to essentially betray the Crusaders. Um, and after the brilliant victory of Simon de Montfort at Muret in 1213 uh, you know, against the Aragonese and, and their allies, right, the, it, it, it sees the, the first great employment of a flank attack in, 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 in uh, western warfare, at least in feudal times, but by that scale, but th that, that degree of coordination, the crusader uh, leader marched into the Valentinois and forced Amar to surrender several of his castles out of a universal revenge, because aside from whether this land was French or Holy Roman Imperial uh, alike, um, the allegiance towards the papacy the crusade was pretty much universal so the crusader leader could punish uh, even uh, uh, as in this case what was technically still a French vassal but um, a holy roman imperial one at the same time because the count of Toulouse at least in theory was a French vassal and of course the Albigensian crusade was a even a struggle against the Capetian centralizing the fort but uh, the Valentinois Dua, as we've seen, was within, as such within the Holy Roman Empire and being vassal at the same time to the Count of Toulouse. So pretty complicated um, business in theory, but not in practice, because again, you just you know um, are stormed 
by the crusading army uh, and you there is not much there that even the emperor can do because he has to cope with much more direct business and um, most of which derives from the attrition existing with the papacy that by some degree the, the emperor is still trying to avoid so you're definitely not intervening against somebody that has sided against uh, uh, alongside the heretics after having first been a crusader so betraying uh, christ and uh, you know it, it's just you know a situation that of course we must understand from imar's perspective but that also was probably ill considerate and trying you know to, to save what you could but then you realize that it was too pressuring and you change uh direction immediately so complicated um simon de montfort defeated again amar of valentino dua in 1217 the year after though montfort died as you know in the siege of Toulouse, he was smashed in the head by a mangonel shot allegedly meant actually women in fact by by women action by women and as you know that brought to the collapse of this uh, lordship that the Montfort had created as a crusading leader after an otherwise substantially successful campaign so Raymond of Toulouse began to recover his possessions in the Marquisate, even though uh, the the entire region and the surroundings were shattered heavily by by the war. And this brought even the city of Avignon uh, to be reconquered by the count. This triggered Innocent III because uh, the Pope had awarded Raymond of Toulouse. Uh, w with with the city of Avignon at the Fort Lateran Council in 1215. Uh, this brought other forces against the Council of Toulouse. It was, as you understand, a pretty destabilized situation, so war fl uh, flared all over. And what occurred, actually, is that the same uh, appointee uh, on behalf of the church to hold Avignon, William de Beau, another great Provencal family, was um, was killed as um, as a crusader by the rebels of the city herself that didn't want such uh, direct. Uh, papal government. It's kind of ironic considering that the papal crew would <laughs> be literally shifted in Avignon and also make it a great part of her fame later. The murder of William de Beau was so outrageous that Louis VIII, King of France, decided to step in. Right? It was a good chance because the matter was very serious. Uh, the war in the south was somehow affecting uh, the north as well, at least now the king of France uh, that had um, secured an, an important amount of power such after Bouvines and the expulsion essentially of all the uh, the Angevin uh, rulers, at least the, the English ones we can say at this, this time from from the continent, could concentrate to systematically subjugate the south. And again, Simon de Montfort had somehow um, began to reconquer um, uh, on behalf of, of the same of the same king by some degree at least aside from the broader crusading purpose and also interfering in the same area that was in the hands of the Holy Roman Empire right Avignon was part of the Holy Roman Empire in 1226, Louis VIII arrives with an army and lays siege to the city. This was a huge deal internationally, because up to that point, the King of France, albeit mostly concentrated in the events of the Ile de France and the immediately surrounding lands, we made multiple videos about the Capetian uh, 
political territorial compaction was quite gradual over time, had never stepped into the Holy Roman Imperial territory per se, and she didn't just you know intervene, not not because of a war against the emperor that at times had even invaded France and so on, um, but literally claiming like uh, the the right to 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 administer the local justice at the end of the day, because bringing order also through war, that's what you're basically um, claiming to have the right uh, to do. So much that the Capetian had to send an embassy to Frederick II to apologize for his actions that were a flagrant violation of imperial sovereignty in the Kingdom of Burgundy, explaining that um, his military intervention had been rendered necessary by the presence of swarms of heretics and essentially a lot of uh, crimes going unpunished right and in the process the papal legate had taken control of the marquisate of provence by the way so that um at least a another universal authority, the one with which in theory the emperor should have been always um, in uh, in harmony with, had uh, secured um, the uh, the er the area, and so everything could be solved now between the, the pope and the emperor. Um, this event actually showed how far the French king's power now had come. Right, and uh, the fact that Frederick II reigning from Sicily and just occasionally coming to Germany to bring uh, not even order anymore in a sort of public um, monarchic sense, but literally in a few in a few years, literally selling the, the imperial uh, rights in exchange for for actual power, right? In as 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 if he had been any other. German prince rather than uh, the emperor uh, was showing uh, a, an important turn in European policy that was somehow predicting even the the further the further developments of. Plus, in the Treaty of 1229, Count Raymond was forced to cede to the papacy all of his possessions on the left bank of the Rhone which the legate then entrusted to the King of France's officers at Beaucaire. Mm -hmm. Thus, pushing forward towards actually a French control surrounding Burgundy um, from the, the right bank of, of, the, of the Rhone and the increasing pressure of, of, of the French crown of that territory across the Alps that the emperors at this point could even hardly um, reach and and that they were still aware of in the potentially useful battleground not not uh, literally meant because the holy roman emperors and the kings of france didn't have any interest say at going at war with each other even um, it would be the, the count of provence and yes still count of anjou but on his own account to um, eventually go fight against uh, the king of Sicily, the Hohenstaufen, but in a time which Manfred was not even Holy Roman Emperor, but still at least Sicily pertaining dynastically to the to the Hohenstaufen. So that's yet another um, page, but the fact that that, that uh, Charles of Anjou was Count of Provence was still a way to say, okay, we're not really the French, right, the French kingdom to to carry this out. Raymond of Toulouse manages to reacquire control of the so-called Marquisate, um, but after his death in 1249, the papacy literally buys the, the Comte that Venaissant portion of it, um, although at the time still without the city of Avignon, that remained the joint property at that point of the Counts of Toulouse and of Provence same time this wasn't so important as far as any kind of autonomous Occitanian power was uh, in Toulouse was, was concerned uh, but rather on the gradual acquisition of those lands that the Capetians would, would make um, so there was 
nothing else but French pressure to increase uh, in the Dauphiné, in the Lyonne, also the Vivare, uh, the same Valentinois. In fact, the new Count of Provence, Charles of Anjou, so literally the brother of the King of France and uh, the peer of France, with, with the County of Anjou, etc., um, installed himself uh, and uh, began to recover the County of Gap from the Dauphin. So, um, this um, picture, of course, shows what any other count would have probably done. Like, Charles of Anjou was powerful, but um, also nobody was really gifting you with anything. You had to carve your own power on your own. We will see. We, we made a video about Charles of Anjou and partially addressed his uh, policy in Provence, but we will see it better in another video that was more in detail. Um, Yet this event um, triggers the intervention of Louis the Ninth in the affair because he forces Charles to let the Dauphin hold Gap as a fief, mm -hmm. uh, and thus also probably reducing some attrition that could have been possible with the same Holy Roman Emperor that yes had seen because everybody could become. Uh, your vassal, Charles of Anjou, in that sense, was uh, an imperial vassal, as Count of Provence. But still, of course, his French role was 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 felt. So Louis the Ninth tried to, to balance out the situation. He was also involved in much uh, bigger games than his brother, at least uh, uh, up to this point. Um, in fact, Louis the Ninth mediated um, in other disputes uh, within the same Holy Roman Empire. For example, um, the one in 1269 between the Count of Savoy and the Dauphin, showing to the same emperor, at least it, it, w it wasn't an emperor at this point because it was an interregnum, um, but um, in fact, thanks to it that the French king was more important than the claimants to the imperial throne in solving the disputes between imperial vassals, right? And this was also uh, a, a quite relevant uh, move. Also, Louis was, as you know, shrouded by an hour of, of sanctity already in his life, and he was... Um, a, a legal expert, his um, judgment was um, asked by several uh, rulers in Europe because he was provided with a, a dramatic uh, insight and, you know, and um, governmental intelligence. So all this was done in a measured way without necessarily stamping it directly, as, as you understand. And still maintaining the fact of what were the traditional you know, uh, rights between the, the empire and, and France. Uh, he arbitrated also uh, a controversy between the citizens and the canons of the Church of Lyon uh, that in 1271 would essentially grant itself as a as a citizenry to Philip the third of France um, who had stopped in fact in the city on his return from the crusade uh, and this is how Lyon actually entered you know in theory unlawful way at least by the ju ju juridical norms of the time the codified ones uh, in the within the kingdom of uh, of France, rather than in the Holy Roman Empire, the same citizens of Lyon accepted to make annual payments to the French royal belly of Mahon, who was further north um, and within France. And in 1292, the city was declared officially to be part of the Kingdom of France. Mm -hmm. 
So here we are at the time of Rudolf of Habsburg. Um, still a moment, which the fact that there is no Holy Roman Emperor, right? Uh, the Swabian is just um, a king of the Romans, uh, ruling in Austria, by the way, uh, at this point. So um, the the power of the French monarchy is at, at its peak, and the uh, French rulers can afford to literally say, okay, the, the Lyonnais that traditionally, albeit lying west of, of the Rhone, has always been part of the Holy Roman Empire, now it's it's ours. Right, and the reason why, of course, Leon was acquired like this it is also partly strategic, meaning that if w w which uh, which ruler from Germany could put Leon under siege by the late 13th century was well, probably no and uh, no strategic or logistical capacity to do so, and so uh, the French would simply uh, make it a matter of fact to keep the control of the entire area. Similar French encroachments through royal officials occurred during the same period in other lands west of the Rhone, including the Vivarais, despite in that case the repeated protest from the local bishop, the one of Vivier, who was often even supported by the Pope because uh, the Papal Curia had, uh, of course, supported France as this alter empire, but especially since the Angevin conquest of Sicily, uh, you know, it had began to to, to sweat cold because it was now risking to be surrounded even worse than when the Hohenstaufen were um, kings of uh, of. of say were emperors but also kings of, of Sicily. Um, thus there was still a, a reverence towards the imperial rights to some degree even for you know, more interested reasons. Anyhow in 1286 the Bishop of Vivier was forced to recognize the King of France as his overlord as well. An important French intervention, as far as the Dauphiné affairs are concerned, occurs in the dynastic succession um, from the Burgundians to the Tour du Pont, La Tour du Pont. John I died without heirs in 1282. Beatrice de Faucigny uh, had been acting as her son's regent since the death of Guy VII in 1270. And she recognized um, immediately Humbert de la Tour du Pont as husband of her elder daughter Anne as the new Dauphin. As a consequence, um, the, the Duke Robert II of Burgundy, like Anne, uh, a great grandchild of Duke Duke III, claimed the Dauphiné on the grounds that an imperial thief could not pass to a woman, because traditionally it was just uh, the male primogeniture, or at best sort of split, you know, um, uh, surely some titles and possessions and assets in, um, in favor of the first born son, not daughter. Uh, this quick succession was probably carried out to prevent the aforementioned disruption of the Dauphiné internal power that, however, had to face still an important opposition from uh, the side of traditional enemies of the, of the house, such as the one of Savoy, mo most of the Chalon, while Humbert received the support of the Faucigny, but also of the Count of Geneva and the same Count of Valentinois du who were fearing that Savoy, that was essentially the most um, important contender, and also, as we'll see now, supported by the Habsburgs, so by what would have been the uh, would-be imperial 
authority that by winning could have you know hegemonized the the area not conquering it directly because it was beyond their their possibilities but still creating um let's, let's just say weakening the dauphine which was part of their their interest probably not so much the one of robert uh, that wanted to rule over it, and and in this sense, the Habsburgs with Rudolf um, that invested, in fact, Robert with the disputed territory, still, however, uh, going at war for it. So in January 1286, Philip the Fourth of France um, intervened importantly. Like Philip the Fourth uh, incarnates the the greatest power in medieval France um, and he essentially forced Robert to renounce his claims on the Dauphiné in return for 20,000 livres tournois and all of Humbert's holdings in the valley of the Anne River. So an important compromise that was showing again how France could move in against the King of the Romans and simply um, you know, uh, continuing the process of hegemonization of, of, of the area. Um, the holdings that Philip IV had granted to Robert were essentially a group of Castellanese north of the, the Viennois, known as the Manche de Coligny, which by 1289 had been ceded however, to the Count of Savoy, Robert's chief ally, in exchange for Savoyard possession in the northern Bresse, that would, uh, in the future, also keep constituting a bit of a problem between France and Savoy, because uh, from there, um, at least it, it was an important communication route, again, between Italy and, uh, and France, between kind of continental Mediterranean Europe. Um, yeah, there were... They were a seat of, of tournaments, of fairs, and so on. But they constituted a frontier between Savoy and and the and the Dauphiné, with some fierce wars that would break out accordingly. So um, we'll see that perhaps better in a, in a 14th century history of the Dauphiné, because they are some of the bitterest struggles, the true Hundred Years' War, <laughs> fought um, for this deeply, you know, intertwined possessions. In, that kind of juridical, political superimposition, uh, and so on. Thus, by the end of the 13th century, we see the King of France, and not the Emperor anymore, to settle the succession crisis in the Dauphiné. Right? If it had depended on on Rudolf of Habsburg, the, the matter could have been solved with, with bloodshed. The, the French simply bought their enemies off and simply kept, you know, integrating the Dauphiné, right? Um, in 1294, Philip IV acquired the Liège homage of the Dauphin Humbert I by means of a pension of 500 pounds, right? Thus paving the way for the definitive um, acquisition of the Dauphiné by the French monarchy some 50 years later as we've seen also in the other video. So how was the Dauphiné practically administered at this point? Well, pretty similar to you know, this kind of Viennois area, even to Savoy when we will discuss it, uh, except that compared to, to the latter, there were no centralized institutions other than the itinerant court of the Dauphin, right? The Savoy, uh, house had already managed to install an important net of, of administrators of some sort of essentially of, of cooperation with uh, kind of traditional uh, right holders um, as we've seen uh, there was less resistance that Savoy met also um, as far as the ecclesiastical baronies in their in their lands compared to the Dauphiné. Um, it was, if you want, a typical um, thing for 
let's say that this kind of sized um, polities like the Dauphiné to just rule through an itinerant court that administers justice and just derives from the, the vassals its own uh, its own authority, its own prestige. Um, it, it was surely working towards a more centralizing direction, but the Dauphiné would uh, continue for a long time, also during the late Middle Ages, to to be to be backward, especially compared to to, to the rest of France and um, still in Louis XI time, there was a lot to 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 do. Eventually, it was done in a military way to literally dislodge certain uh, vassals from their own encrusted privileges that had fundamentally paralyzed the land and not allowed for a more efficient unified administration. So it was at this point perhaps you, you can't see the difference so much because uh, other European institutions were not so even radically beyond but already again with what the Capetians were doing in their own dominion uh, there is uh, no no comparison as we've seen even with the neighboring Savoy etc um, so it, w it was still a lot of matter of possessions cumulation rather than else that surely triggers some kind of administrative changes but uh, to some small degree um, a very important step in the development of the defense authority occurred in Frederick II's reign when um, Gig VII was uh, confirmed in 1249 with the acquisitions in the counties of Gap and Embrun, as we were re recalling before, um, and especially the grant of sovereign rights over all allodial proprietors, both there and in the counties of Viennois, Albon and Grenoble. So basically in a, in a dramatically uh, wide amount of territory for the Dauphin, even capabilities as we'll see now, to affirm such right, um, the local rulers were um, given uh, by the emperor the, the privilege just of um, disposing of the local allods as fiefs, which was incredible. Like in the same Germany, you can argue that they they, they failed the, the national monarchy uh, through uh, the the refusal of kind of a loyal of imperial claims, even imperial claims, not the one of a local lord on the prince's allods. So lands that by tradition could not be touched even by 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 anyone because they were considered like full property and not part of that still originary Romano-Germanic idea that all the land was public domain and thus the kings by right of conquest right um, this could have opened naturally there was a pretty um, almost revolutionary measure Frederick took but that reflects a bit the desperation of the sovereign that was close also to, uh, say, he didn't know he, he would die the, the year after, but he had suffered uh, exactly at that point the defeat of Fossalta. There was a lot of his imperial policy uh, in Italy collapsing, so he was seeking some support from, from anyone, in this case the Dauphin. Um, Frederick was dethroned and excommunicated as an emperor at the time. So the Dauphin could do a few with the formal recognition of claims of supreme authority, right? Uh, which actually were being successfully instead exploited by uh, the Counts Peter II and, and Philip I of Savoy because of the more advantaged um, political administrative position that the Counts enjoyed in their um, in fact, in their dominion. As in Savoy and the Franche Comte, the 13th century was a great era for town enfranchisement. Uh, this happened as much as 59 times in the Dauphiné. Mm -hmm. uh, this was a way, of course, to counter uh, the vassal, uh, uh, the vassal's power, because, like, if you 
give city or uh, say town rights autonomy privileges uh, immunities etc to, to a town you can avoid the uh, local barons to to take over the center that will be tied to you as the as the overlord um, in um, in a sense, even though these areas were historically urbanized, quite Romanized, etc., Burgundy had not been flourishing as a more updated state, and so even the citizenry power was somehow modest, right? It's true that Occitania is a bit in between, like the degree of autonomies that the Italian communes enjoyed and the that harshest, uh, you know. Uh, vassalatic feudal culture of, of the Capetian dynasty. Mm, some cities in, in Burgundy are also important um, because rather of the strategic position on their own, right, rather than kind of a pre-existing dramatic mm, kind of infrastructural or, uh, or just uh, otherwise political role. For example, in Grenoble, such town right I love just a modest beginning of a of a citizenry autonomy right uh, things like regulating dues and taxes on their own uh, furnishing a penal code and freeing the inhabitants from most manorial obligations I mean it wasn't so much but it, it still was heading towards a bit more of kind of a modern uh, administration in these policies the Dauphin were lagging one century behind Savoy, Chalon, um, especially as far as the internationalization of the Dauphi uh, of the Dauphiné was concerned, like uh, in front, chimes aimed at establishing, for example, trade routes, which were strengthened uh, the annexation of newly acquired territories. Uh, to be completely fair, um, especially during the 14th century, the Rhone Valley would lose for international reasons. Uh, an enormous amount of uh, of power and, and wealth and uh, importance in the in the in international commerce, especially that, as you know, had um, greatly benefited the, the area because it was just in between the the Tuscan markets and the Champagne fairs. Thus, that was the major route, like for. Um, English wool, Flemish textiles, uh, the great agricultural fairs of Champagne, then all was connected by the Rhone Valley to the Italian city-states markets. Um, in the 14th century, instead, there is the Hundred Years' War, aside from the general contraction of economy uh, altogether, is the Hundred Years' War, so the entire, especially the southern France, is, is ravaged heavily by the, the English armies. Then you have the Genoese being knocked out by the uh, the Aragonese and obliged to open the Atlantic route as opposed to keeping their business in the Western Mediterranean like before. So a huge amount of uh, the the Champagne fairs declined. They're disrupted. Um, Flanders and England fight against France. It also collapses into Burgundy that expands in other areas. So it's uh, I'm talking about the Dutch of Burgundy, not this Burgundy here, the Kingdom of Arles, Burgundy. Um, the the former being actually in the in the Kingdom of France proper. So this major highway of the Rhone Valley uh, ceases to be as important as before. The Venetians open with Central Europe the the Bavarian route, so it's um, it's a wholly different scenario. Today we just talk about the 13th century, but I talk about the future not just for the sake of it, but because you realize that if that crack hadn't happened specifically to the region, like the 13th century accomplishments of the Dauphiné weren't even that bad, right, for, you know, trying to improve further. But it's the general crisis of Europe that cripples everything here. Um, uh, the the international crisis of the 14th century, I mean. Um, if we're talking about the strict, um, kind of most average administration of Delphinal government, we're looking at the, the local castellans, right? That's what it was. These were appointees uh, 
in control of fortresses that had some uh, some force rights attached uh, uh, at Delphine al administration. When the Dauphin acquired the counties of Gap and Embrun, as we have seen before, he found there that was a more advanced form of administration because there uh, this were kind of the Mediterranean side of the story that were even the the Belli were called Belle, right, as in Provence. And they had a hierarchy, right? They had they, they were under the supervision of a bel general, so a general bailiff who answered directly to the count of Provence. Um, and this actually helped the Saint Dauphin to modernize a bit their own administration because they introduced such bellage in the rest of the Dauphiné, so that by the, the end of the 13th century there were seven of them in the Delphinal Dominion. By the end of, of the century also the judicial administration was in the hands of um, of Juge Major Vibel, who essentially held the seizes once or twice a year in the Castellanes. So in this last mm, say phase of the great medieval civilizations, the Dauphin them by themselves have managed to um, to modernize something and in fact even the, the last ones in the 14th century had pushed the thing forward but we will see it uh, on another occasion before however the country went bankrupt and so literally uh, the, the 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 dynasty didn't even well he it, it did end because there weren't really male uh, heirs but uh, the Dauphiné was literally sold after actually a very long negotiation with lots of different players uh, this area also could have ended in the control of the, the papacy entirely over other even of the king of Naples eventually it was the king of France who seized it but um, and and still the problem remained in terms of remaining largely a Holy Roman Imperial territory so uh, what is that we can say about this 13th century Dauphiné politically wise well first of all it objectively manages the most important accomplishment managed to maintain um, an important amount of uh, of territories in a and expanding in others and securing them as such both from the local uh, say the surrounding powers and and the French monarchy that was beginning to loom in, uh, to loom all over um, especially the latter was aware evidently of the Dauphiné power because it not only intervened in the succession crisis but also didn't fully step into it uh, as well because um, this was an area that objectively would have been also very very hard to fight in for many reasons not just the territory but simply the distance from the main power base of, of, of the King of France that would have had also to justify a major conquest um, campaign of, of a Holy Roman Imperial territory that's not what mm, nor Louis the Ninth or Philip the Fourth or the greatest uh, rulers at this time wanted really um, the uh, Savoy enclave in the Viennois and the possessions of the Council of Valentinois Bois were an important break to the Delphinal expansion they were literally wedges um, disrupting the Delphinal lines of communication in their own valley so that there wasn't a broader um, control on, on, on the waterway, on the major waterway. Um, and uh, in spite of, again, the control that existed uh, on important riverways in the Grosivedan, in the Bransonois, that were all affluents uh, of the Rhone, uh, but from, uh, again, controlled from provinces that were pretty mountainous and not quite productive uh, per se. Savoy was better located in general for the connection between Italy, France, Germany um, and so they controlled so larger cities and at some point at least in their history so 
it was just better placed in practice the Dauphiné didn't have practically any capacity to invade the uh, Provence altogether that was huge right in across the mountains the rivers and so on so um, there, there were some say at least the, the so-called Marquisate of Provence that is this um, it's it's a good third of uh, of the entire Provence right or at least almost a third um, was pretty aggressive as we've seen towards the same Dauphiné and it was somehow equivalent in size right so Dauphiné was really squeezed between Savoy and this Marquisate of Provence and there was no way they could alone kind of uh, let's say managed to, to, to break through in this regard. Lyon was occupied by France as we've seen so all the major centers assigned from uh, Vienne were in somebody else's hands right so no, nor the enemies had the force individually to just take over the Dauphiné and that's why the, the kind of the dynastic crisis were, were important because perhaps on the longer run generationally they, they could have exploited that but obviously there was also um, someone always wanting to preserve the unity of this power if they had to, to step in right so uh, that's where the balance was formed so from one side you, you find the legal basis for a sovereign state to have been laid even the one for central administration but the possibility of bringing them to the next level were far the land was not able to sustain that on its own and it would be fundamentally um, under the French that this, this thing was fully surpassed right and that happened in the later centuries so yes um, I think it was very interesting to deepen a bit the the history of the Dauphiné after the first video we made so that this can be added to the various historical region maybe not not the series but uh, the, the broader puzzle kind of um, mosaic that we're making of the various historical uh, regions in Europe right step by step we're going to cover everything time allowing for today however I stop it here I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content and for now I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time bye